Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm so excited to have Louis Jacques and Jabali Shah today from Abbey to share with us uh, their insight about the whole thing about um, access, uh, reimbursement coverage and pricing. As you can tell how ex important that is and how complicated and how difficult that can be. And um, one of the things uh, when I talked to Shivali and Louis Jacques is about how, you know, everybody's talking about value base right now. What does that mean? Um, you know, it's, it's it's a buzzword that everybody use. And I think sometimes the payer thinks that everybody understand it because it seems so makes sense, but then what they understand might be different from what the uh, innovators understood them. So I thought, you know, um, both of them has a lot of experience in working with the pairs. Uh, this would be a good opportunity for them to share their insight with you. So, but before we start, I'd like to make a quick introduction of the, our two amazing speakers today. Uh, so first one with the ladies first, Shivali. Uh, Shivali Jassi is a principal at AppVee and she has a lot of experience in the biopharma industry, but uh, she specialized in the areas of reimbursement pricing and commercial development. So it's very appropriate. And so she started her career in Lewin Group. And so she has done uh, BD diligence, revenue forecasting, pricing and reimbursement. And then for Louis Jacques, uh, he is the senior vice president at, president at AppV and she, he is also the chief clinical officer there. And Louis Jacques has uh, served in many different institutional boards and also advisory panels. Before joining AFI in 2014, he was the director for the coverage and analysis group in the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So he had a lot of that experience and he has um, worked in a you know, very diverse technology from molecular diagnostic testing, implanted cardiac devices, advanced imaging, all the way to chemotherapy, you know, you name it. And so with that, I don't want to take too much time of uh, their time. Um, so they're going to start soon. But before I let them start, I like I want to let you know that both of them will take question uh, along the way. So if you have any question, please uh, submit it in your Q&A box and both Louis and Shivali would answer the question uh, along the way during the talk. So with that, take it away. Thank you. Can you all see the slides? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. All right, uh, Louis, you are up. Um, th thanks, Shafali. Um, and the way this is gonna go, just so the audience knows, is about the first third of the slides are mine. My, I'll be a little bit more philosophical and Shafali will give you a lot more detail about some of these things. Um, so I'm gonna present more how a, how a payer looks at the things that are called innovation um, when they come to us. And sorry, I'm in a hotel room in San Francisco, so uh, things are going on behind me. Uh, from a payer point of view, the only thing we actually cared about at CMS was the actual benefit to patients. Medicare is by design cost blind. We did not look at cost when making coverage determinations. And literally what we were looking at is for our population of interest, which is in general older women, um, because women outnumber men over the age of 65, you know, are these patients, our beneficiaries, gonna be better off or not with the addition of a new technology, whether one calls it innovative or not? Uh, many people would come to us and say, well, well look, we, we've done this in a different way. We're, we're innovative in some particular way. And, and frankly, it doesn't matter. The only thing that really matters is whether or not the patient's better off. And whether you do that with a new biomaterial or a new process or something else, it, it is of marginal interest or, or tangential um, interest to us. There certainly have been innovative technologies that in fact have turned out to be harmful. Um, sometimes people would come to us saying, well, you know, the physician will feel better with this new technology. And what I used to tell them is, I'm paying you to make the patient feel better, not to make yourself feel better. So unless that physician or hospital process has some benefit to the patient themselves, i.e. if you do a process better and there is some patient benefit, sure, we'll have some interest in it. Other than that, not particularly. 
Um, Medicare, much more than commercial plans, is at least willing to engage programmatically to support innovative technologies. In general, commercial health plans really don't care and they really don't care to have a conversation either. Um, CMS will care to have a conversation and you may or may not like what their answer is, but their answers are, are driven by the law. Uh, Medicare will cover FDA approved IDE trials and IDE is an investigational device exemption for those of you who may not be in the device space. And what this is, is, is FDA allows a manufacturer to essentially ship these products across state lines um, for the purposes of doing a trial under the supervision of, of FDA. And by law, Medicare is allowed to review these trials and to go ahead and cover routine clinical costs, as well as in many cases, the investigational item or service itself. Commercial health plans generally have zero interest in paying for anything before it gets out of FDA. Um, CED is coverage with evidence development. Um, there are times when particular technologies will have a, a narrow focus in their evidence. For example, they may have looked at only short-term outcomes around the hospitalization itself and not collected outcomes, you know, six months, 12 months later, is the patient still better off? Or, or, or do all the adverse events essentially get, get sort of backloaded in this space? Um, or maybe the studies only looked at people in a certain age group that was younger by Medicare standards. It's fairly common knowledge, it's been reported very frequently, that the people who tend to get excluded from healthcare clinical studies are older people, women, and minorities. Well, Medicare is essentially insurance for the elderly. Most of the survivors after age 65 are women, and certainly many are minorities. So if you come to CMS with a study that you did in healthy 50-year-olds that enrolled very few minorities, potentially because it was done outside of the United States, in a country that doesn't fundamentally have a lot of minorities in the population, or at least US minorities, you shouldn't be surprised at all if CMS says, well, you know, it, it's interesting, but what we don't know is whether this technology is gonna behave the same way in a different population. And, and that's, that's not a crazy thing for Medicare to say. For example, if you are using an orthopedic surgical appliance and you specifically excluded menopausal or osteoporotic subjects from enrollment in your clinical study, a reasonable payer might think, well, wait a second, your skeletal system is changing, including your spinal column. And maybe the success of this spinal implant, frankly, depends on having a young, healthy spine and not an older osteoporotic spine. The clinical trial policy there's a policy that CMS developed after an executive order from Bill Clinton in the last year of his administration. Um, so for certain types of studies, for example, um, drug trials on new cancer drugs, um, what, what FDA would call an IND or an investigational new drug, um, trials sponsored by NIH and others, um, Medicare will pay for the routine clinical costs um, in those trials. There are also new tech payment programs. And, and what these are for, um, as many of you probably know, many of the things Medicare pays for are done in prospective bundles, um, diagnosis related groups, for example, for inpatient hospital. And what a manufacturer might say is, well, you know, the hospital is getting paid X amount of money. My particular technology produces better patient outcomes but it is more expensive and the hospital will have a disincentive to adopt my technology unless Medicare pays more. So there are some instances uh, where Medicare based on certain criteria in the law will decide that a particular technology is not part of the bundled service but could in fact be paid under a different rubric separately. Uh, next slide please. So why do innovative technologies fail to get enthusiastic reports? Um, I've talked to a lot of audiences over the years, including you know, the National Venture Capital Association, multiple uh, physician specialty groups and multiple industry groups. And it's often, hey, you know, we're doing all this innovative stuff. How come you guys aren't terribly interested in it? 
And what I usually say is something along these four bullet points. First of all, did you bother to ask us, the buyer, what our needs were? Okay, if you innovate based on your own needs as the vendor, there might well, you know, in fact, it'd be shocking if there were not a disconnect between what you think I want to buy and what I, in fact, want to buy for the population that I'm interested in. Um, and if the innovation is, well, we have a new material, for example, metal on metal hips, okay, that didn't work out very well. And one doesn't need to read the healthcare news um, to know that. Or robotic surgery, for example. Gee, that sounds cool. Why don't you do robotic surgery? You have a small incision instead of a big scar. And that didn't work out very well either. Um, sometimes the innovation has unclear incremental value. Gee, it seems like it would work, but, but you know, let's actually test it. And some of this has actually happened. And, you know, Shafali will talk a little bit about ICER later. You know, sometimes there actually is a marginal incremental benefit, but the benefit is this much. And, and, and what the manufacturer wants is, is something like that. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is the example of metal on metal hips. And what happens is when you put metal on metal, you get essentially micro abrasion, you get metallic particles. And patients were complaining of all sorts of symptoms, some of which were somewhat vague, almost like autoimmune syndrome type um, symptoms. So it was a little bit challenging to actually, you know, get everybody to figure out what was going on here. Uh, but metal on metal hips are essentially one of the recent poster childs for innovation that actually harmed patients. Uh, next click, please. Um, FDA put out a, a, a warning about a year and a half ago on robotically assisted surgery in women's health. And one of the examples is in pelvic or abdominal cancers. Okay? Uh, the traditional surgical approach is to actually do you know, a surgical incision, take out the diseased tissue or organs, and actually look around to make sure you haven't missed anything uh, because tumors can sometimes spread within the abdominal cavity. And what FDA found out is that, you know, even though after robotic surgery, the patient will tend to feel better in the short term because they had a couple of small incisions instead of a big one, the problem is their cancer outcomes were worse. So in other words, by doing a smaller procedure, you actually got a significantly smaller benefit. And if what you're trying to do is to get rid of cancer, if what you're giving up in getting that new procedure is the ability to more effectively get rid of the cancer, um, you can certainly understand why patients and payers themselves would say, wait a second, you know, it sounded good, it sounded intuitively appealing, you know, it seemed like one of those, duh, it's obvious, but it turned out it wasn't. Um, the next one, please. Um, you know, once IBM Watson managed to play Jeopardy, you know, the world went to AI. And, and we often get asked, how about AI for this, AI for that, AI for something else? Um, and this was actually was, um, reported that this happened to, to be, you know, the clip that I found, but it was in all the major press as well. Um, these are the electrical engineers, but the headline is how IBM Watson overpromised and underdelivered on AI and healthcare. And, and the more detailed reports that came out at the time said that the inputs were actually being done by physicians because Watson couldn't figure it out. So it, it was actually human intelligence as opposed to artificial intelligence that was actually driving any results. Um, next slide, please. So this is what I call the plumbing paradigm in progress in revascularization. Revascularization is essentially, you have a diseased blood vessel, uh, excuse me, that's my contractor calling me, sorry, um, who's working on my house on the other coast uh, because I'm in a hotel. Um, the challenge here is that when you're trying to open a vessel, at some point, there are a limited number of ways that you can open a blood vessel. You can only be so successful. I mean, it's, it's a relatively small piece of anatomy. Um, and what I compare it to is essentially opening a drain because increasingly companies come to us and say, well, we have a slightly better way or a slightly different way of opening this blood vessel. And at the end of the day, the, the patient seems to be in the same condition they were in before. Uh, so this one's unique because the first technology was digital, i.e. if you wanted to clean out a drain, you had to stick your hands on it. 
Um, but as technology got better, the, you know, the orange plunger is something that many people have. But if anybody happens to be a mechanical engineer or was a plumber in another life, there are plumbing configurations where that won't necessarily work very well. Uh, the blue one, you crank on it and this big spring goes down and, and digs up the clog. And the one on the right is the blue one, but with a power drill on it. And one would say that each of these is an advance in technology. But for any of you who live in a home that has a drain, how many of you have the one on the right? I'm willing to bet just about none of you. Because unless your job is doing that day in and day out on fraternity row, what you will find is that either the orange or the blue one in the middle are absolutely fine to meet your needs. And because they don't blow your budget, you have enough money to do other important things. Uh, next slide, please. So this is, if any of you have ever had a physiology course, this is the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve. I'm not expecting you to know it, but the point here is that when there's not a lot of oxygen in your hemoglobin, and as I hope you know, oxygen travels in your bloodstream bound to hemoglobin in your red blood cells. When there's not a lot of oxygen attached to those red blood cells, you put a little bit of oxygen in and that saturation of oxygen goes up very quickly. You're on that steep part of the curve, a small change on the x-axis gives you a big change on the y-axis. When you're already pretty well saturated, you can push and push and push, and you're gonna get very little change in the end. And that's what happens with many new technologies is people see a market where there's a lot of patients, but there's already been a lot that has happened in the last 30 and 40 years. So the room to improve is actually very small. So people end up spending millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to do long trials that may need to enroll instead of a couple hundred patients, maybe 10,000 patients, because the incremental difference is so small that statistically, to show a statistically significant difference and to show a clinically meaningful difference, you need to spend a lot of money to try to get a small amount, which raises the question, maybe that money should be doing something else. Um, next slide, please. So when, when payers think about this, incremental benefits and large costs, it's interesting to see what is the incremental benefit of many technologies that we actually take for granted. Um, physicians and payers um, use a concept called the number needed to treat. Um, in other words, how many patients would you have to actually treat with this new technology to actually get that target difference that was reported in the trial? And, and numerically or mathematically, it's one over the absolute risk reduction between the two arms. And if you ever wanted a lot of information on this, there's a website called the NNT, um, and it's all there. Uh, but essentially, suppose, and, and this is actually a real example, suppose you have a procedure that reduces the risk of stroke around the time of the procedure itself from 4% to 3.5%. So a manufacturer would say, well, you know, 0.5 over 4 is roughly about 15, 16%. Hey, we have a 15% stroke reduction. The payer and the physician should look at it as a 0.5% stroke reduction because the stroke risk is relatively low in the first place. So one over 0 0.005, because we, we're converting percents into decimals, is actually 200. You would need to treat 200 patients with the new technology in order to avoid one stroke, which certainly sounds a lot less impressive than saying 15% stroke reduction. And for those 199 patients who got the new technology but did not benefit, the question then becomes, what are the adverse events here? And you know, what, what price did they pay, not just in terms of dollars, but in terms of their own health, in order to get something that actually did not benefit them? Uh, next slide, please. And, and this is, we're coming around the clubhouse turn for people who are tired of listening to me. Um, so here's some screenshots from the NNT. If you look at video laryngoscopy, which is actually looking down to see your vocal cords versus direct, which is where a physician takes an, an instrument and literally like pries your tongue up and, and, and looks down there directly. It clearly works. It's clearly beneficial. It's something, yeah, you take fiber optics and video and it works very well. Um, the next one's a little bit in the middle. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, coronary stenting for non-acute coronary artery disease compared to medical therapy. Uh, many people know someone who's gotten a stent put in. I mean, essentially it looks like a finger trap um, sort of device that expands inside a blood vessel to keep it open. Uh, but what's interesting here, in this particular patient population, when they look at the studies, and if I had done a bigger screenshot, you would actually see all the literature um, cited underneath. No patients had their life saved or a heart attack prevented or their symptoms reduced. One in 50 actually had some sort of complication, kidney damage, bleeding, stroke. So it makes you think, huh, okay, may may maybe if you're a payer deciding whether to pay for this, maybe you should kind of think about it and, and, and you know, make sure that the value is commensurate with the risk. And then the last one here, which is in bright red, um, statin drugs given for five years uh, for disease prevention without known heart disease. Um, and essentially what it said was, yeah, um, if you look at the number needed to treat it, uh, more deeply, they actually show a much higher benefit for the Mediterranean diet than for using statins in certain populations. So it's just something to keep in mind that even when the headlines talk about something being a, a great new development and people say, hey, I want to be the next statin. I want to be the next coronary stent. From a payer point of view, well, well, you haven't made me enthusiastic about your technology. If anything, you've made me potentially a little suspicious that I need to pay attention to what I'm getting. Um, let me stop there for questions. It just seems like a natural place to stop for a minute. Um, of the Q&A, um, yes, um, I, I have met uh, one of you before on, on a different topic back when I was at CMS. Um, you know, we, we can't sort of say hello formally, but hello. Um, and in the chat. Any other questions? No. That was it. Oh, here we go. How does Medicare or CMS view things differently than private payers? Um, uh, in a couple of different ways. Um, when Mark McClellan, who was the uh, second administrator in the second Bush administration, um, he had previously run FDA. When Mark ran CMS, one of his first pronouncements was to say, CMS, which is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, is a public health institution, okay? As opposed to just being a payer. So, so what Mark's vision was, was that CMS, to the extent that it can within the law, should try to be proactive about things that will potentially improve patient outcome. Um, and because Medicare never gets rid of patients, okay, you don't switch out of Medicare to something else. Once you're in Medicare, you're in Medicare. It's not like you're in Blue Cross for three years, then you go to Aetna, then you go to United Healthcare. So for CMS, we're not trying to just keep you alive long enough till we can dump you into some other health plan uh, because we have you for the rest of your life. Um, so Medicare takes a more fiduciary look at these sorts of things. Medicare is cost blind. Um, if you take, except for prevention and screening where Congress actually specifically um, directs the secretary to take a look at, at cost and cost effectiveness. Um, if, you, if you get a bunch of commercial plan medical directors happy and not, um, shall we say, um, filtering everything they say, and I won't describe what situations those might be, uh, you might get them to admit that, yeah, cost matters. And cost matters a lot. And if you come in and say, you know, you, that, that you, know, you might save the money, they're like, well, we want proof that you actually will. If you walk in and say you're gonna cost them more money, frankly, they don't want to talk to you and they're likely to try to, um, to push away that conversation because the last thing they need to do is to blow their budget. And, and like anybody else, they have, you know, they have reasons to want to stick to a budget. Some of those may be more sympathetic. Some of them may be less sympathetic. Um, th th those are the major differences. The, the Medicare is not so focused on cost and, and Medicare does look at the long game. Um, nobody in Medicare gets a bonus if we spent less money. I, I mean, li literally, so it, it's not an issue. And let's see, next is from Alex Luce. Um, Do you know how perception of value from payers may apply to new and emerging AI? Um, here's the challenge with AI. Um, and, and part of it is the way AI is, is, is described. 
we're already paying for human intelligence with a physician. If a physician uses something to supplement their own intelligence, then arguably the physician is doing less work. We're simply substituting something that we already pay for with, with something that isn't in general separately paid. Um, because when, when Medicare thinks of software, when payers think of software, well, lots of things have software. A CAT scan machine won't work without software. A PET scanner won't work without software. An EKG machine won't work without software. We are already paying for software, but we're paying for it in the context of we're buying an EKG, we're buying an advanced imaging test, and we don't split it apart and say, well, we're gonna pay you for the magnet, we're gonna pay you for the software, we're gonna pay you for something else. So AI has had a little bit of a challenge because what do you do with standalone AI? Um, one would argue standalone AI is a physician. Well, we already pay a physician and AI is not you know, sort of licensed by a state board to practice medicine. Um, so there's been some challenges there. There has been one recent example of where CMS gave extra payment in the inpatient hospital setting to an AI supplemented imaging. Um, it was around in the vascular disease space. And talking to some old colleagues, what they said there was because it was done in an inpatient hospital setting, AI was considered to be an inpatient hospital expense because that's the context in which it occurred. Um, and what they were doing was not making a separate payment for the AI. They were paying more money to the hospital because of the hospital's cost had come up. And that's why AI has been of a, a bit of a challenge. You know, one with the Memorial Sloan Kettering Watson thing, it frankly didn't work very well. And, and number two, CMS doesn't want to, you know, sort of pay the physician for doing the job and then pay someone that pay something else for doing what the physician was responsible for in the first place. You know, if a physician wants to use an algorithm in the old days, a Palm Pilot or a Newton to go back, you know, 30 years, you don't get paid more to use something to supplement your own job. Um, let me hand things over to Shafali at this point and I will go on mute. Sounds great. Thanks, Louis. Um, and if you want to keep an eye on the chat and the questions, um, you can actually type in your answers if people are still asking you questions. Um, okay, let's see. Oh, there we go. Um, so I am going to talk much more specifically about third party value assessment. And we'll talk a little bit about how that can or maybe will start to impact payer decisions and pricing. One thing I just want to add, since this is a San Francisco based audience, um, while I did start my career at the Lewin Group in DC, I actually left Lewin to go to Genentech. And I worked at Genentech for a number of years um, in South City, and I lived in San Francisco. And that's actually an old, old map of um, my neighborhood in San Francisco up on my wall. Um, and then I worked at um, a few other biotechs after that and have been consulting for about the last five years. So um, Louie and I don't always agree on everything, which is actually fine. It makes our conversations very lively and I think we bring different perspectives. Um, but I think one thing we, we do agree on is that the way drug prices have been increasing over the last few decades is not commensurate with the improvement in outcomes. And I think the way he characterized it is you see an incremental improvement like this, but then you see the manufacturer wanting to take a price increase or price premium like this. Is It's true for the most part. Um, I think unfortunately that's generally the case. So um, because we all love data, um, you've got some nice graphs here essentially showing the relationship um, between progression-free survival in that top chart. And as progression-free survival, has improved, um, prices have really increased even more dramatically and same with overall survival. Um, and so to some extent, I think in part because of the aging population, but also the, um, the increase in the price of the drugs and the number of drugs, there are just so many more cancer drugs, rare disease products, um, you name it, every disease area has more products than it did 5, 10, 20 years ago. What we've seen is payers really trying to take this into their own hands and manage the spend. Um, as Louis said, I won't um, reiterate too much, but Medicare, for the most part, 
is cost blind and really has to cover FDA approved um, products in those indications. And we frankly see a lot of coverage outside of the label where it's medically appropriate. Um, a lot of the states have um, off-label coverage mandates. Um, of course, we have 50 states, we've got a district, we've got some territories. So it's you have 52 or more different rules for off-label coverage. Um, cancer, for the most part, and we're seeing a little bit in rare diseases, tend to be treated like the special children. Um, I do think that's maybe coming to an end a little bit in oncology. Um, and then really diving into the thing I want to talk about is um, about this notion of health technology assessment. So we don't have a formal HDA process in the United States. Um, if, if anyone is from the UK or familiar with the UK, you know there's a body called NICE, and they are a government um, body responsible for doing economic analyses on new products. And NICE must recommend that a drug be paid for um, for the National Health Service in the UK to pay for it. And they often will negotiate a price, which is also something we don't do here. Um, so we're gonna talk about an organization in the US called ICER, which to be very clear is not a government body. It is not, it doesn't have a formal role um, with CMS or with any payers or within the government, um, but it's funded out of private money and their um, entire kind of internally set mandate is to assess the price of drugs. And what we're seeing is that payers increasingly are very interested in using their assessments. Um, so just to give you um, just a little bit of background, I would say in the last five years, uh, maybe last, yeah, five, five to seven years, I've seen more evolution with this idea of value frameworks than in the 15 years prior to that, that I was in the industry. And it's really been kind of logarithmic the last few years. Um, some of the value frameworks you'll hear tossed around, ICER we're going to talk about a lot because that is emerging as the most influential body, probably the most robust assessment group. Um, ASCO, which is the American Society for Clinical Oncology, which is really more of a physician and clinical organization, um, has started to review therapeutic classes and include cost effectiveness and budget impact. Um, they don't use qualies, uh, which is quality adjusted life years, so they use some softer metrics. Um, and there's no real formal role for it. So there is some encouragement that physicians talk to their patients about a drug score or what the financial impact may be to the patient, but there's no real mandate. Um, NCCN um, actually develops guidelines for how um, different diseases should be treated. So in first line lung cancer, they will say these are the recommended therapies. And second line, it's this, and they do that for all the cancer indications. And they have actually started rating um, rating drugs as well, but almost more in a uh, more evidence um, focused way, is there a lot of evidence to support use? And again, there's no real role for any, um, any financial um, aspects. And then the drug abacus has mostly gone by the wayside, but that was developed out of Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, and really it was kind of an interesting tool where you could toggle um, you know, this drug has a great side effect profile and that's important to me. So I'm going to give that a high score. And then it would at the end kind of spit out a value score. Um, and I think part of the reason that has gone by the wayside is because it was so subjective and you could get, depending on what you said was more important to you, you could get three different scores for the same drug. Um, so let's talk about ICER. Um, and ICER um, I, I mean, I could talk about value and talk about all of these different groups for hours, but ISA really is emerging here in the US, particularly in the last like three years, as the go to for quantitative cost effectiveness analyses. Um, it is an independent organization, it has no role um, with any government bodies. Um, they're a not for profit organization. Um, we can talk a little bit about why I'm making the funny face um, when I say that. Um, and they, their whole focus is to analyze cost effectiveness of drugs and other medical services in the US. Um, they do partner with academic institutions to do a lot of these assessments. Um, I know um, University of Washington is very active. I don't actually, I'm trying to think if there are any 
um, academic organizations in California that have been active with them. Um, and WashU and St. Louis as well. Um, and um, really they focus on clinical and cost effectiveness. They do budget impact related work. And really what they're getting known for is that they will essentially come up with what they think the value-based price of a product should be. So, and I have some specific examples later in the deck where a drug will come out priced at 100,000 for a course of therapy and they will run it through their model, um, which really does overemphasize things like overall survival and sort of underemphasize things like um, quality of life or um, any patient related metrics, patient preference, um, and it'll spit out a price and they'll say, well, this drug probably shouldn't have been 100,000. It should have been priced at 50,000. Um, now, no one necessarily has to do anything with that, but payers are starting to notice. Um, now, it is interesting, I think, and important um, that ICER is funded largely out of the uh, Laura and John Arnold Foundation. They are individuals um, who have kind of made drug pricing um, one of their things that they're very interested in. So they started ICER and they fund it. Um, and ICER does also accept funding from met drug manufacturers and payers. So um, I put this up, really, we're not gonna read through all of this, although you're welcome to speed read it, uh, really just to show that ICER um, takes a very broad view. They are not focused only on oncology. They're not focused only on, drugs, um, they kind of look at lots of different things and largely they're focusing, they, the things that catch their interest are kind of the new, hot, interesting topics. So um, it's kind of a no brainer that they will have looked at all the new CAR T therapies, which are the cell therapies. They're looking at the gene therapies. They've looked at the new um, hemophilia drugs that have come out that have been um, pretty transformative, but also very expensive. They have looked at the PSK9. So they look across disease areas. They've also looked, as you can see, um, at some digital apps and telehealth approaches. And actually recently for the first time ever, they looked at a vaccine. They looked at the COVID vaccine. Um, so again, just to show like they do take a very broad approach. So let's talk about methodology. I'm just gonna do a time check, okay. Um, so they, um, so their bread and butter is really doing these economic models um, where they will pick either a specific drug or a class of drugs. So I think uh, the CAR T's, the cell therapies, um, there are now three approved in diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and there's actually one now approved in multiple myeloma with the second uh, CAR T coming in multiple myeloma, maybe the later this year. Um, and so what ICER will do is they will kind of take that, that class and they'll say, we're going to look at all the CAR T's in DLBCL and they will um, develop models. They will use publicly available information, but they will actually dialogue with manufacturers as well. And if the manufacturer has data that are not in the public domain that they're willing to share or able to share, they will uh, look at those data as well. Um, they don't have to. They also, um, if there are methodological issues that manufacturers do point out to them, sometimes they will adjust their methodology and sometimes they won't. Uh, and I think there have been some scenarios where they've probably used a particular methodology because it gives them the result that they want. And there are other times where they have actually acknowledged that they've maybe made a mistake or chosen um, an insufficient methodology and they will actually change their methodology and do the analysis over and then republish, which I think is important. Um, so again, these um, cost effectiveness models, particularly the ones where they have now started to say, here's what we think a value-based price is for this therapy or this class of therapies has really become their mainstay. In addition to that, um, they um, also have started just recently in uh, late 2019, started looking at what they call unsupported drug price increases. Um, and they um, initially, the way they were doing this was they would take the top 10 drugs in the US whose price increases contributed the most to the largest net increase in drug spending. And then what they'll do is they'll do a three-year look back and say, okay, what new clinical evidence came out um, that maybe justified 
the price increases that we saw. Um, and as you can see in the first, in the inaugural report in 2019, um, what they found was that at least using their criteria that seven of the nine drugs had inadequate evidence to support um, the clinical, the type of clinical benefit that would justify the price increases. And um, I am somebody who's worked in this industry for a very long time now, gosh, 20 years maybe. Um, and I have to say, I do look at these price increases and they are not commensurate with the advancement for a lot of the time with the advancement of the drug. You see drugs that have been on the market for 20 years and the price has gone up 400% in those 20 years but the drug itself hasn't improved 400%. It's, you know, some accounting for inflation. Some really is just keeping up with the prices of the newly launched product. So if you're the 20 year old drug in colon cancer um, and new drugs are coming out today in colon cancer, they're coming out at a much higher price. So there's some ability to just raise your price to play catch up. And that, um, is also the kind of thing that ICER um, looks at and, you know, wavering off, um, maybe going on a little bit of a tangent, thinking about legislation and legislative activity that we could see, I really wouldn't be surprised to see something like um, capping of price increases, especially within the Medicare program, where Congress could do, could do that um, if they all kind of got together and talked to each other. And it wouldn't surprise me to see something like that. And I don't even know that that's something the industry would fight back on too much, just because we are seeing these price increases. You can see in the, in the table how much the price of some of these drugs has gone up in very short periods of time. Um, so one of the things that I certainly um, talk about both with drug companies and on the policy side is that pricing for value at launch is really your best bet and companies should not be relying on kind of these endless 10, 15 percent annual price increases um, because I do think that is, those days are probably coming to an end soon. So ICER um, recently, actually just in the last month or two, um, has decided to revise their methodology. And this, I actually don't have that much of a problem with, um, you know, kind of looking at the price increases over time, how they've been um, trying to figure out which drugs, um, you know, that meet their criteria with very high spend, high price increases, big populations, um, which of those maybe have unsupported increases. What they're trying to do now is that they're, they're making their own criteria a little more arbitrary. And so what they're now trying to capture are drugs that have had price increases that maybe raise concerns about the fairness of the increase. So it could be a very small population. It could be a rare disease drug where it's not having a big spend impact on the overall population because there are only 100 patients in the country getting it. Um, but it may already be a very expensive drug. So by taking a three or 4% increase, it's resulting in a large dollar amount increase. They wanna start now capturing drugs like that. Um, and you can see uh, in the list, in the light blue table on the right, these are just some of the ways that they're looking at broadening the criteria. And so what they wanna do is essentially still assess 10 based on the criteria on the prior slide. And they wanna capture three more that are just based on public input and based on the drugs that they think they want to target. Um, and that starts to feel more, less methodologically sound and a little bit more um, like just trying to, to find drugs that will kind of further their story. Um, another area, and I realize I'm talking very fast because we've got um, less than 15 minutes left. Um, another area, and this, this is again as part of maybe some of the back and forth and the dialogue that one can have with ICER. Um, there is, I think, some recognition that some of these therapies that are either curative or transformative can't be assessed in a traditional uh, cost effectiveness model. They're just, the models aren't designed for a product that you give once and you charge $400,000 for that one dose but you may get years of benefit out of it um, as compared to a drug that maybe is 10 infusions over a one year period, um, but only costs 200,000. And so they are really looking at different methodologies for assessing 
these potential cures and transformative therapies, even one-time therapies, recognizing there's patient benefit to only having to go in once and not having to go in every two weeks. Um, and so I don't think, I think this is a really difficult area. And so I think it's wonderful that they are looking for how to assess these appropriately. Um, but I don't think there's been a great answer yet. But as they continue to do assessments on cell therapies and gene therapies, most of which are one time and do tend to be multiple hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars, um, but also potentially curative, um, it's been a little bit of a learning process as they go. So let's actually look at two examples. Um, this is from 2016. Um, for those of you who've spent any time in the oncology space, you'll know the immuno-oncology therapies for lung cancer about five years ago really were seen as just a, a complete breakthrough in the space of lung cancer. Um, and um, they have huge market share. I mean, I don't think you can be treated for lung cancer these days without getting at least one of these agents, um, assuming you're, you're eligible clinically. And so what ICER did was they really, they looked at the um, cost effectiveness ratio. So the qualities there, you see that's a quality adjusted life year. So that's essentially the cost of one additional year of life on one of these therapies. You see on the low end, it's 219,000. On the high end, it's 415,000. Um, and then based on the qualities and a number of additional uh, metrics, um, they came up with the value-based uh, discounts that they would expect. And so the numbers right below there, the 30 to 50%, 50 to 68%, those are the discounts that they said would be necessary for these drugs to actually be delivering value um, because they're not delivering value at the current price. And this is where I feel like this conversation could go on for so long because I would argue to the lung cancer patients who before these therapies um, we're really in a very dire situation. Um, maybe there was a lot of value from these drugs at the price that they were priced at. And I think that's where some of this gets hard because somebody could say six months of life isn't worth it. But unless you're that person um, or maybe somebody in the family of that person, I don't know that that's kind of your place to say that. And I think that's where these value conversations get so complicated and they do get emotional. Um, and I think there needs to be some way to bring together these different perspectives because I also don't discount the payer perspective, um, but there's a physician perspective and there is a patient perspective which somehow always seems to fall to the bottom um, when these discussions are happening. And I think that is something that really does need to change. And that is something that is not incorporated into ICER assessments or NICE in the UK. Um, or frankly, a lot of the time it's not um, factored into how manufacturers price their drugs. Um, so I think everybody all around could probably do a better job there. So that's the older one. Um, this is uh, for the cell therapies. Um, so in 2018, there were two approved cell therapies. Um, and I'm sorry, there's so much going on on the slide. But um, the takeaway, if you don't want to read all of this, essentially is that these two cell therapies, despite the fact that the price is, um, you know, 373000 and 475000 um, for these drugs, they actually did fall within the cost effectiveness uh, parameters um, of under 150000 per quality. And it is because these drugs are transformative one-time therapies that were delivering um, significant um, Result in very late line DLBCL patients where there really wasn't anything else for these patients to take. And a lot of these patients were at the point where they'd go on palliative care. And so the fact that they were seeing survival benefits and cures in a small percentage um, is, is what's driving those assessments. So I just thought that was, I thought it's kind of an interesting and useful example to see that just being much more expensive doesn't mean you're going to get a bad score, a bad score, if you will, um, because it is about the clinical benefit that is being delivered. Um, okay, I can't believe I covered all the slides. Um, so just you know, thinking about it from a pharma or biotech perspective, which is usually the perspective that I am working from, um, really making sure you have stakeholder support 
um, I think in your pricing activities um, and also in your clinical design, and I think Louie talked about this a little bit, um, but I would take it further and say, you know, beyond just making sure you have kind of a representative population that payers and physicians want to see, um, making sure that, you know, your endpoints make sense and that your studies are robust. And um, if Louie were on screen, um, I think he'd be he'd be delighted to hear me say this, but, you know, we see a lot of drugs get approved with limited data. You'll see, um, you know, phase two, right, Louie, phase two <laughs> approvals based on phase two studies. And now a lot of those companies go on and do very large phase threes um, to get full approval. But I think it's really hard to make a sound decision as a clinician or a payer when you have phase two data in 150 patients and the drug comes out is $150,000, $200,000 for a course of therapy. So I think to the extent that manufacturers can develop really robust studies and give the physicians and payers really good data to do these assessments on, um, I think it just gives everybody more comfort. Um, I think, you know, Interacting with ICER can be a double-edged sword. Um, I have worked with companies that have worked very closely with ICER while their products are being assessed. And in one case, they were able to have enough of a dialogue that some of the methodologies were adjusted um, and came out actually looking more favorable for their product because ICER recognized that there were different methodological approaches to take and uh, maybe there were better ways to look at it. So I think really, not viewing ICER antagonistically, but really viewing them as yet another stakeholder. Um, and there's a fine balance there too, because they are not a government entity. They don't have a mandate to do this. They have given themselves a mandate. So I think there's some questions about how much do you engage with them? And so I would just say that's probably a case by case basis. Um, and then um, this was just sort of an example um, of something that uh, we worked on where we were helping with an engagement with ICER. And these were just some of the best, um, best practices that we developed as we went through the process. Um, and now I know this was very drug focused and there are probably a number of people on this um, who aren't exactly um, in the drug space, maybe you're in AI or other tech, um, I think the point that value assessment is sort of all around us stands. And even if it's not ICER now, it could be ICER or another similar body in the future. And I think if we start to see commercial pairs at least really look at these value assessments, we could see the scope of the value assessments broaden. Um, I think drugs are a very easy place to start because there's so much noise, but I, it wouldn't surprise me to see that spread to diagnostics and devices and further from there. And I think that may have been the last slide. So I am going to stop sharing and then maybe we, um, Louis, you and I can just look at the uh, Q&A and see if there are any other questions just in our last five minutes. Okay, I've been blowing through the QAs. I've oh, been through a dozen of them. Fantastic. Great. So. so I'm done. <laughs> Let's see. Um, okay, you have, are there any you want me to address on the screen? Yeah, anything that says ICER. Uh, I, ICER knocked okay. out, <laughs> I knocked out a few of them, but you're, you're okay. closer to it than I am. Um, yeah, I see Divya asked, um, they do uh, deal with medical devices and definitely non-biological therapeutics. So I assume by that you mean, um, maybe I'm getting too technical, but biologics are kind of the protein-based therapies. So like the IOs, the traditional monoclonal antibodies, but they will definitely look at non-biological products. They, um, if you go back to that list, um, or actually you guys don't have the slides, but you can actually look on the ICER website and look at their topics of interest, which typically they'll put up every year and kind of follow along what they're assessing. They do take a pretty broad um, approach and I think it's getting broader. It looks broader to me every year. Um, let's see, what else? CMMI, you got that. Um, CMMI, I'll just add something there just because I've done quite a bit of work with them. Um, so they, um, they often run what we call demos. And so sometimes these are kind of trial balloons to see 
you know, if we change how we reimburse X over here, what happens to patient access? So the thing with a, a demo for CMMI is that it has to have a research question. It can't be just sort of a willy nilly, we want to change reimbursement, so we're gonna do it. Although um, previous administrations have tried to use CMMI that way. It has not always gone well because um, they um, have a mandate set by Congress. So there are rules that they have to operate within. Um, and I also have worked with CMMI, CMMI from the manufacturer side where we've gone to them and said, you know, we want to do outcomes-based pricing. Like we would like to say if our drug works and you get a complete response or whatever the metric is, um, you pay for the drug. And if you don't respond within 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, you sh the you shouldn't have to pay for the drug. And that's not something that one can do really structurally within CMS right now. And so I've gone with clients to CMMI to talk to them about, would you help us set up a demonstration like this? Um, and while we've not been, we've not been able to get that uh, going yet, that is uh, kind of a routine topic of conversation, both at CMS and CMMI is about value-based arrangements. That could be a whole separate uh, meeting, spend another two hours talking about that. Um, let's see. Wow, Louie, you did did answer a lot of these. Um, oh, Divya, I'm just responding to your earlier. Um, yeah, so you're interested in the bundled payment amounts. Yeah, all those, they're called diagnosis-related groups and they're DRGs. Those payment amounts um, are available. I don't know if they're public. Louie, how do we get DRG payment amounts? Are they public or do we have to pull them off of somewhere? Um, I think they're public. I think they are. Um, Divya, I'm happy to talk to you offline about that. If you, we can figure out how to maybe connect to me on LinkedIn um, and we can chat about that. But those are those DRGs are definitely out there, um, at least on the Medicare side, uh, probably not on the commercial payer side. Um, it is five o'clock, Christine. I want to be respectful yep. of the. Sorry, I'm on the East Coast. It's five o'clock in the East Coast. No, I was like, oh, no, it's not five o'clock yet. <laughs> but it is I'm time. Not here. <laughs> well, thank you so much uh, for your time and sharing your insight with uh, our community. And uh, with that, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you. Bye.